Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, uh, and happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 124 of Left Side of the Aisle with me, Larry Erickson. And uh, for the next half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things that uh, I think matter and that I think you should know about. If you have any reactions to the show, comments, questions, hints, tips, whatever, uh, write to me directly. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, and if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a message there or you can uh, get the email address from there as well. All right, so with that, let's get started. Let's get right into it because, again, I get to start with some good news, as I always like to do. I've got a couple of bits of good news here. Uh, the first one is that uh, relates to the fact that the decision by the U.S. Supreme Court to strike down key portions of the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA as it was known, uh, this is beginning to have a real impact on people's lives. For example, last week the Treasury Department said that if a same-sex couple who are legally married in one state uh, move to another state where such marriages are not recognized, for federal tax purposes the government will continue to recognize them as married. In other words, the state of celebration where the marriage is performed determines a marriage, not the state where you currently live. Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu said, quoting, the ruling provides certainty and clear, coherent guidance for all legally married same-sex couples nationwide, and it assures them that they can freely move throughout the country knowing their federal tax status won't change. And the thing is, this doesn't affect just like income taxes and filing status and so on. Uh, it affects things like employee benefits, IRA contributions, earned income, child tax credits, gift taxes, estate taxes, among a lot of others. It, it applies to all federal tax purposes. The thing is, the Pentagon, the Office of Personnel Management, and the Social Security Administration had already moved to extend federal benefits to uh, legally married same-sex couples among federal employees and military personnel, but the IRS had not acted to state its own position on the matter. Now it has. Now, unfortunately, the policy only applies to married couples. It doesn't apply to domestic partnerships or civil unions. But it is a st still, it's a real, real step forward. Um, and it's a part of the ongoing increasing recognition of the reality and the rights of same-sex couples. Uh, another bit, actually, on that same topic. Uh, that is the, the uh, impact of the Defense of Marriage Act's overturning be by the Supreme Court. For the second time in two months, U.S. District Judge Timothy Black has issued an order requiring the state of Ohio to recognize the out-of-state marriage of a same-sex couple, even though Ohio does not recognize same-sex marriages. Uh, the more recent order, Judge Black allowed David Mishner to be listed as spouse on the death certificate of his husband, William Herbert Ives, who died last week. The couple had been married in Delaware. In July, Judge Black had granted an order allowing James Obergefell the right to be listed as spouse on John Arthur's death certificate after uh, Oglebefer uh, uh, and uh, Arthur were married in Maryland. In both cases, Black cited the fact that key parts of DOMA had been struck down in his ruling. And by the way, even in Ohio, apparently attitudes have been changing since 2004. That's when Ohio instituted this state constitutional amendment that limits marriage to one man and one woman. According to a Quinnipiac University poll from April, 48% of Ohio voters and 68% of those between 18 and 34 say same-sex marriage should be legal. Uh, the change is strong enough that there is a plan to bring a pro-same-sex marriage constitutional amendment to the state ballot in 2014. All right, one other bit of good news, a third bit of good news. Uh, this one's actually a bit subtle, but uh, it, it's still an important thing. Remember the no-fly list? Remember that secret list of suspected terrorists that would get you banned from getting on an airplane anywhere in the United States uh, with no way to know if you were on the list until you were banned from an airplane, no way to know why you were on the list, and no way to know how to get off it? Because, and no, no, in fact, not even any way to challenge the claims made against you because those claims were secret? Remember that? Well, 
We've largely forgotten about it. Other issues have, you know, cropped up to take our attention in the time since. But the list still exists, and there are today an estimated 20,000 people who are on this list and can't fly anywhere and have no idea why. The American Civil Liberties Union has been fighting this in court for something over three years now. It's representing 13 U.S. citizens who are on the no-fly list with no way to know why or to get off it. A district court had dismissed the suit on jurisdictional grounds, but in July 2012, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reinstituted it, and the district court is now considering the case on the merits. The good news here is that on Wednesday, August 28th, U.S. District Judge Anna Brown dismissed the government's argument that flying, that air, air flying is merely a convenience and instead ruled the constitutional rights are due, of due process are at stake when the government places people on the no-fly list. Now that doesn't sound like a whole lot, maybe, but in the words of an ACL, ACLU staff attorney, quoting, for the first time a federal court has recognized that when the Ameri government bans Americans from flying and smears them as suspected terrorists, it deprives them of constitutionally protected liberties and they must have a fair process to clear their names. Now, this is not a final win. The case isn't over. But it does mean the government is now in the position of having to show either that it has allowed due process, which it can't, or it has to show that it's going to have some means to allow for due process in the future. And so another part of our paranoid, unconstitutional, freedom-hating war on terror is showing the strain. And that's good news. All right, moving on from there to the Clown Award, one of our regular weekly features. This is given weekly for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week, the big red nose goes to that praiseworthy paragon of vigorous virtue, the National Security Agency, the NSA. Now, this doesn't involve something that happened just this past week, but news of it spread at the end of August. That's when most people became aware of it, and it's just too good to let slip away. It really is. It turns out that back in June, shortly after the first of Edward Snowden's revelations hit the media, a company known for parody t-shirts with slogans like Santorum Happens, um, this, this company reacted to the news by producing a t-shirt with, with a reproduction of the official NSA seal modified to read, Peeping While You're Sleeping, along with the caption, The NSA, the only part of the government that actually listens. Liberty Maniacs is the company that's making the shirts, and they offered it for sale through a popular online market site called Zazzle. But within a couple of hours of this shirt first being offered for sale, Zazzle told Liberty Maniacs that it was taking the shirt down from the site. An exchange of emails as to why finally produced the answer that, quoting, legal representatives from the National Security Agency had contacted Zazzle to say that the shirt, quote, contained content which infringes upon the intellectual property rights of the NSA and at their request, that is, at the NSA's request, the shirt would no longer be sold on that site. Now, this shirt would seem to be a clear case of parody, something uh, based, on a, on a, based on a long string of court decisions relating to the First Amendment and traditions dating back literally centuries, that this is protected free speech. But not as far as the NSA is concerned. No, no, no. It's humorless legal stuff shirts cited Public Law 86-36, which says you can't use the initials NSA, the words National Security Agency, or the NSA seal without first acquiring written permission from the director of the agency. And at the same time, the agency whined to the Daily Dot that it had not sent a cease and desist order to Zazzle. Of course not. It merely, you know, requested by the way, if this wasn't clownish enough, the law that the NSA mouthpieces cited says you can't use NSA National Security Ag Agency or the SEAL, quoting, in a manner reasonably calculated to convey the impression that such use is approved, endorsed, or authorized by the National Security Agency. As one commenter said, only a complete moron would reasonably calculate that the NSA approved or endorsed or authorized these t-shirts. <laughs> Absolutely right, a moron or a clown. By the way, as a footnote, Cafe Press is selling the shirts. Zazzle is now offering a wimped out version that only uses a, it uses a, doesn't use the NSA logo. 
on it. All right, one more thing before we go to break. As I expect you know, a tiny beam of light recently penetrated the dark recesses of our war on drugs. On August 29th, Attorney General Eric Holder declared that the feds would not challenge new laws in Colorado and Washington which legalized recreational use of marijuana. Marijuana is still illegal under federal law, but uh, a department memo sent to federal prosecutors tightened federal standards for initiating prosecutions about marijuana, standards which essentially would leave uh, you know, small-scale recreational users alone. 19 states and the District of Columbia now allow for some legal use of marijuana, most of that for medical marijuana. The fact is, the war on drugs has been a colossal and budget-busting failure, which has accomplished nothing except tripling the prison population. That's in large part because there has been a near total disconnect between the attention and effort devoted to certain drugs uh, from the actual harm that those drugs represented. And both the public and government officials are now awakening to the fact, increasingly admitting to the fact, that one of the drugs which has gotten the most attention is one of them that has the least potential for harm, marijuana. Uh, the result of this is that according to a recent Pew Research poll, a majority of Americans now say marijuana should be legal. But some people just don't want to give it up. No, no, no. In response to Holder's announcement, a coalition of law enforcement officers uh, uh, wrote to Holder, slamming the decision in terms that will remind you of reefer madness. Marijuana, they declared, can be directly tied to violent crime. It causes depression, suicidal thoughts, attention deficit. It's a gateway drug leading to communities crippled by drug abuse and addiction, increasing crime and more mayhem on the highways. This makes law enforcement, they solemnly intone, infinitely harder. Actually, what it will probably make infinitely harder, and I suspect the real reason for their spittle-flecked outrage, is padding their budgets by keeping a large portion of the assets they seize in drug raids, assets which they wind up getting to keep even if no charges are ever filed. It's called civil asset forfeiture. I've talked about this before. What's more, federal grants for drug war operations make up a sizable portion of local law enforcement budgets, funding that's turned even small city police forces into something more like militarized combat units, complete with heavy body armor and sometimes armored vehicles. This shift from neighborhood police to paramilitary occupation forces is another outgrowth of our war on drugs. And I strongly suspect that the cops and the others who are so outraged by Holder's announcement are more concerned about being kicked off the gravy train than they are about being confronted with hordes of violent suicidal hopheads. Still, they were right about one thing. Holder's decision opens the door to other states taking steps toward legalization, expecting to get the same kind of treatment Washington and Oregon did, or Colorado rather did. Ten states are regarded as the most likely to take steps in that direction, and they're an interesting combination of red and blue states. They are, alphabetically, uh, Alaska, Arizona, California, Maine, Massachusetts, Montana, Nevada, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Vermont. The war on drugs, another war desperately in need of an exit strategy. Let's take a break. And we're back. Uh, all right, first off, just a, a quick RIP to mention the passing of TV host and interviewer David Frost, who died August 31st at the, of a heart attack at the age of 74. Frost is probably best known to American viewers for his post-Watergate interviews with ex-president Richard Nixon, where after letting Tricky Dick squirm away from him for the first hours of the interviews, Frost went after Nixon with pointed questions about Watergate until he broke him down and forced him to admit he had failed the American people. But he was also a satirist, a game show host, and a serious political commentator uh, who interviewed almost every British prime minister and every American president in office during his career, which spanned five decades. 
Now, where I first became aware of him was when he hosted uh, the American version of a satirical news show called That Was the Week That Was in 1964 to 65. Besides Frost, who acted as host, the regular cast featured some names you might know, including Henry Morgan, Buck Henry, and Alan Alda, with Nancy Ames singing the opening song, which had new lyrics every week to reflect the news of the week, those songs often written by Tom Lehrer. However, I have to admit, you know, full disclosure here, I hated the show because it was on opposite the Twilight Zone and my family wanted to watch That Was the Week That Was and I wanted to watch the Twilight Zone and never got to see it. So I hated the show. Anyway, uh, besides presidents and prime ministers, uh, Frost also interviewed people ranging from Mikhail Gorbachev to Benazir Bhutto and from Orson Welles to the Beatles. It was quite a career. R.I.P. David Frost. All right, moving on from there. I have not talked about global warming for a while, so I thought I'd run down a few recent bits and pieces. Let's start with the latest news. The latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. This is the world's preeminent climate science organization. Their latest report is due out sometime this month. Now, the most recent draft of the report says that human-made global warming is extremely likely. What that means is the odds that humanity is responsible for global warming that we're seeing are about 95%. Continuing emissions at or above current rates, the report says, would produce changes in climate unprecedented in hundreds or thousands of years, and many of those changes will persist for, quote, many centuries, unquote. Worldwide, 2012 was the eighth or ninth warmest year on record, despite the cooling effect of it being a La Nina year. The United States and Argentina each had their warmest years ever. It was the 27th year in a row where global average temperature was above that of the 30-year period 1961 to 1990. The World Meteorological Organization said in its annual climate report that the years from 2001 to 2012 were all among the 13 warmest on records. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, says that all 10 of the warmest years on record have occurred in the last 15 years. And we are already seeing human impacts. This is not just something in the distant future. A study by climate scientists at Great Britain's National Weather Service, which was released a couple of months ago, concluded that human-induced climate change contributed to the lower rainfall in uh, East Africa in 2011, making global warming one of the causes of the famine in Somalia and the tens of thousands of deaths that resulted. And then there's this. You ever hear of valley fever? I hadn't either. Uh, it's a relatively unknown and often misdiagnosed disease that's prevalent in arid regions of the United States, Mexico, and Central and South America. It's uh, con contracted by breathing in fungus-laden spores that are uh, disturbed by wind or by human or animal activity. Initial symptoms are often flu-like, but the disease can spread from the lungs, leading to blindness, skin abscesses, lung failure, and death. Between 1998 and 2011, cases in the United States jumped 850%, with California and Arizona being the hardest hit. Now, why is this relevant? Because the fungus here is sensitive to environmental changes and a hotter, drier climate of the sort now being seen in the U.S. Southwest has increased the dust that carries the spores. In other words, global warming is helping this disease to spread. And speaking of the West, what about those wildfires? Are they connected to global warming? Well, according to Thomas Tidwell, head of the U.S. Forest Service, the answer is yes. Uh, in congressional testimony in June, Tidwell noted that large fires, which are ones in excess of 10,000 acres, are seven times more frequent today than they were four decades ago, and the fire season is two months longer. He said agency scientists believe that the problems they face are due to climate change. And it's going to get worse. 2012 saw record snow melts, a dramatic spike in ocean heat content, a record melt of Arctic sea ice, uh, and whopping temporary melts of ice in most of Greenland. It also saw record high sea levels, a harbinger of things to come. 
A study published a month ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences says that climate change could literally sink more than 1,700 U.S. coastal towns and cities underwater. And that is before this century is over. Without a sharp and immediate curb in greenhouse gas emissions, at least 80 of those cities might be underwater by the end of the decade. And in some places, it's already too late. In some places, now the author mentioned Fort Lauderdale, Miami Gardens, and Hoboken, New Jersey. For some places, even if we stopped all greenhouse gas emissions today, even if we dropped emissions to zero right now today, the heat already stored in the oceans will cause the ocean to rise enough that by the end of those century, those places will be underwater, and in many more places, a quarter of the population would be living below the high water mark. Those are the facts. That's the reality. That's what we're facing. Despite all this, despite this obvious and, and, and clear evidence of dramatic need for immediate, dramatic, even drastic action, in at least four U.S. states, Louisiana, Texas, South Dakota, and Tennessee, it is mandated by state law that children in science education be taught global science denial, global warming denial. Now, this is all based on model legislation produced by ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, a right-wing group that specializes in making this kind of legislation. It's hard to imagine that the people at ALEC are that stupid or that blind. I mean, these aren't stupid people. So the only conclusion I can come to is that they just don't give a damn about the future. As a footnote to this, by the way, at a House Science Committee hearing on climate change in June, climate science non-believer Representative Dana Rohrabacher griped about a campaign against so-called climate deniers in Congress. He claimed the climate denier is akin to Holocaust denier. Yeah, well, he said it. I didn't. But if he's really that upset about this, maybe he'd prefer my name for people like him. Nanny nanny naysayers. All right, for the last rest of the show, I'm going to be talking about stuff related to Syria. There is now, as I'm sure you're aware, a case being made for a U.S. attack on Syria. This case is based on, take your pick, reports, claims, allegations, intelligence, whatever term you care to use, that the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad carried out a chemical weapons attack, a gas attack, on the rebels who have been fighting his regime for something approaching three years now. In that time, in those three years, by best estimates, over 100,000 Syrians have been killed as the fight evolved from a government crackdown on a peaceful protest movement into a full-scale civil war, eerily reminiscent of the war that's racked Iraq for the last decade. A civil war which, let's not forget, we unleashed with our invasion, and a civil war which just saw 67 people killed in a bomb attack yesterday. In Syria... Ethnic massacres have been committed by both sides, and each side has allies that are considered terrorist groups. Again, in that last two and a half, five years, uh, two and a half years, over 100,000 Syrians, both fighters and civilians, they have been shot, shredded by shrapnel, blasted, bombed, slaughtered, and strafed. They've been murdered by mortars and mauled by mines. There are two million UN registered refugees from the war in Syria, half of them children. The total number of refugees may be as high as seven or eight million. And across that time, across those three years, the world, including the United States, watched and muttered vague threats and shuffled their feet and turned away because the demands of international power, politics, and posturing spoke louder than the wails of the wounded. Oh, but now that's going to change. Yes, sirree, that's going to change. Our Nobel Peace Prize president, he's going to show that Assad guy. Yes, that's sir, you, that's for sure. Well, why now? Because, the White House claims, Assad killed 1,429 people, a number I find suspiciously precise. 1,429 people with a chemical weapons attack. Now, yes, chemical weapons are, re are regarded as particularly horrendous. Yes, they are banned by international law and treaty, legal concepts which don't seem to concern us much under other circumstances. 
But yes, they are horrendous, and yes, they are banned. And yes, despite some lingering doubts, well-founded in the utter failures of American intelligence about Saddam Hussein's supposed weapons of mass destruction, but despite lingering doubts, and despite a surprising number of claims that this is a false flag operation, that is, this is actually done by the opposition gassing their own people in hopes that it could be pinned on Assad and provoke a Western intervention, despite all that, I'm quite willing to accept that Assad used chemical weapons. On the what? Doctors Without Borders says chemical weapons were used. That's good enough for me. Uh, on the who, I find the false flag claims utterly unconvincing, the product of wild pro-Assad speculation, which leaves Assad as the who. But I have to ask, are those victims any more dead than the 100,000 others? Were their screams any louder? Do their families mourn them any more deeply? So why now? Is it actually because of chemical weapons? No, not really. It's actually because of what we said about chemical weapons. It's about the red line we drew. It's about our credibility. It's about, as John McCain said, sending a message, not just to Syria, but to Iran, North Korea, and any group we consider terrorist. It's about because we said we would, not because it will accomplish anything other than creating an even bigger pile of bodies. Even the White House doesn't claim that there's limited strike. Uh, by the way, the White House has a very strange definition of limited strike. Uh, appearing on All in, the, uh, All in with Chris Hayes on MSNBC on Tuesday, former National Security Council spokesman Tommy Veter, who was described now as being back at the White House to help Obama sell this, he referred to this limited strike as involving, quoting, a couple hundred cruise missiles. Apparently, pretty much anything short of a nuclear first strike is now limited. Anyway, the point is the White House doesn't even claim that this limited strike will actually do anything. It doesn't claim that it's going to prevent Assad from using chemical weapons, only that will, it will degrade his capability to do so. Glenn Greenwald said it well. I'm going to quote him. There are a few things more bizarre than watching people advocate that another country be bombed, even while acknowledging that it will achieve no good outcomes other than safeguarding the credibility of those doing the bombing. There was so much more that needs to be said about this, so much about how we're supposed to be just so thrilled that Barack Obama deigned to ask Congress for authorization, even as the White House made it clear he don't need no stinking authorization and suggested that even if Congress says no, he may go ahead anyway. He did it in the case of, I mean, he did this in the case of Libya. Why wouldn't he do it again, frankly? But I, I'm, so I will, I swear, I will next week talk more about this, even if the vote scheduled in the House for the week of September 9th has already happened. But I have to stop there because I have one more thing I have to get to. It is the outrage of the week, and it is also about Syria. Foreign Policy Magazine reports that, quoting, American intelligence agencies had indications three days beforehand that the Syrian regime was paused to launch a lethal chemical attack that killed more than a thousand people and has set the stage for a possible U.S. military strike on Syria. They knew. They knew. Three days in advance they knew. They knew that Assad was preparing a major nerve gas attack and they did nothing. They said nothing. They told no one but each other. The Syrian opposition, the target of this attack, an attack so despicable we have to respond with more death or it's a catastrophe for our credibility. The Syrian opposition was not told. The victims, the one who's, te the one who's suffering causes such tears in the high offices of the White House, they were kept in the dark. If using chemical weapons is such a monstrous tr crime, if gassing people is a monstrous crime, what do we say of those who passively stand by and watch it happen? Outrage doesn't cover it. End up with our weekly reminder. As of September 3rd, at least 7,865 people have been killed by gunfire in the United States since Newtown, at least 79 of them in Massachusetts. Have the best week you can. We'll see you next week.